chatting. I don't know how long we we were going here and talking about ourselves. We're live again. Hopefully, still people are. No one's watching yet. Hopefully, people will jump back in on this. Um, yes, yeah, well, yeah. People are starting to come back in. Whoa, if somebody, where am I? if somebody who is now watching, I think everybody's coming back <coughs> in right now. I was looking at Greg. And I was looking at Keith. And we did not see where the broadcast dropped. Uh, yeah, at what point, what were we discussing? <laughs> can, can someone <laughs> give us a line so that we know exactly where to pick up in the conversation? Because we were, uh, we were in conversation. Tell us where we were. <laughs> we were talking about style. I mean, we can go back to that again. Keith mentioned the fact that he used the term maintaining a Hildebrandt, a Hildebrandt voice, looking voice through yes. all the different styles and periods of art that I've illustrated. And I never thought in those terms a voice. I approached it job by job and and took the job on and, and, and styled it in a manner that I thought was appropriate for the job, whether it be a more simplified children's book approach, you know, which is more cartoony, for the lack of better, another term, cuter. And then to a more fully painted look. But when I got the Unicorn Publishing books, uh, there I never thought in those terms at all. I was just thinking in terms of I'm painting pictures. Mm -hmm. I'm, the, I'm not, I'm not. And I kind of like got into sort of a conversation of, I think a lot of books, illustrated books, talk down to kids visually. It's almost I like, the, with you. Yeah. it's like the mentality, well, they're kids, so therefore we should. Mm -hmm we should approach it as though they're kids' drawings. Kids aren't trying to draw like kids. Yeah, no. Kids are trying to draw. Yes, and in your imagination when you're a kid, the things you're drawing looks real to you. Yeah, So, but you're not yeah. trying to draw like a kid. Yeah. I never tried to draw like a kid. I was trying to draw like what I was looking at, you know, yeah. either animation or the Detroit Art Museum or the comics, or I was trying to get that, you know. Yeah. Thus the frustration all those years as a kid, trying to achieve that. Yep. And I was never trying to draw. And I thought, you know, later, you know, especially when we would go over to one for publisher and they were doing these books stripped down and very simplified and very, and I'm not knocking the style. I'm not saying there's anything yeah. wrong with it. It's just the, like, you know, if you, I, Tim and I presented another more detailed approach and they said, well, this looks like, look, like it, it looks outdated. So they're, they're not only are they, are they, they think they're talking to kids in a kid's language of stripped down art, that was also imposed on that or underneath that was these particular art directors obsession with abstraction or, or, or simplification coming out of the 1950s. You know what I'm saying? Uh, okay, yeah. Where realism was debunked. Yeah. Realism was really totally, you know, not, that's, that's, that's not hip, that's not the latest thing, that's old fashioned. And, and if you drew, rounded 3D cartoon characters, I think we talked about this before, you, you used to get the insult of, what are you trying to do? Make a Mickey Mouse. You know, because yeah. Mickey Mouse moved in 3D animation yeah. as opposed to flat 2D animation of TV animation yeah. of the 50s, you know? But, and so, in other words, it's a long wrap of, I, did, I wasn't thinking of illustrating children's books when I did the unicorn stuff. I was no. illustrating books. Telling a story. And those books hold up over time because of that. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, you I know, mean, I, you look at those illustrations and yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah, still yeah. the same punch and, and wow factor. You're, it's not like, oh, this was clearly done in, you know. A particular yeah, time frame or style. Trend. Or, yeah, you know, trend. It's not done in a particular trend. I mean, no, I, at that time I really got into... I had explored, Tim and I both were, were jumping around with styles. I think you do that when you're young, you know? Maybe yeah. you're, you're in, 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 well, you should. You should you yep. know, emulate all kinds of people that you admire. And then you finally, that all settles down and it, it boils away and cooks in, in the stew pot and, and becomes you. You just do your thing. And I finally got, when I was doing the Unicorn books, I, I just kept thinking, well, I'm not even after a style. I, I'm not, the style's out of the picture. That's not a word I'm using. I'm painting pictures. I'm just going to sit down and paint. Whatever comes out, comes out. Good, bad, or indifferent. Well, and what may have been said when we were dropped or not, I'm not sure, but was the uh, 
the, the lighting scenarios and, uh, and typically your unifying shadow color of the dioxin in purple which came about in Urshirak as which gives the paintings an overall visual look mm -hmm. um, but so you know we, we hit comic books and all that stuff last week so the the next biggest jump in your career uh, came in the 2000, I believe it was early. Yeah. yeah. Right at the beginning right. of 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you decided you want to make the, the jump into pen up. Right. Um, and, I, and I said to Gene, you know, I want to do pen ups. I just kind of like I've been thinking about it for a while. That's something I had never done. Uh, and and I grew up on that stuff. Like whoever mm -hmm. mentioned Gil Elbrin. I mean, those are the calendars that I remember my grandfather had. And other people in the family, other men, had these calendars in the basement and they're out in the garage. And I used to, you know, be obviously impressed by them, even as a little kid, and the painting, and the drawing. And uh, so I, in 1999, I, I said to Jim, I want to do pinups. And uh, so we talked. He said, What kind? What are we talking about? And I said, Well, I don't want to do, you know, like, a, a, Fantasy pinups, like there were people doing them very well. Yeah, like you know, Boris and Boris and uh, Rowena, yeah. and you know, incredible uh, stuff. Frazetta, you know, uh, and I did want to do that. And so Gene suggested, well, how about more like something noir ish, you know, film noir of the 40s, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then she said, well, what are you, what are we talking about? You know, I'm, I'm not sure because there's a 14 year difference between us. She's 14 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, look, she said, well, do one. So I did. One. It was called Emerald Evening. Yep. It's like a dancer at a at a men's party. Like, and I was thinking of it as sort of like a, a mafia get together. <laughs> <laughs> and and with this dancer up on the table, a stripper, and you know, pretty basic. And I I kind of looked looked at it as tongue in cheek. I I, I think pinup for me is at least fifty percent satire. It's a satirical idiom. Yeah. Okay. Because you're kind of like putting things on, you know? Yeah. It's like you're exaggerating and putting it on. You're almost like making, that's the point of the picture in a way, you know? Yeah, and a lot of your, I'm trying to, I want to make sure I speak correctly, so if I, if I say something wrong, correct me. But I, I know a lot of the, the early ones definitely had the, the noir type feel and felt like, uh, some of those pulp covers, yeah. like you know, detective stories and, yeah. and things like that, really had that vibe yeah. uh, to them. Uh, but yeah, that's actually when I first met you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd maybe met you briefly one other time for a few minutes, uh, but when you when you walked in with the Emerald Evening painting. Mm -hmm. Um, that was, that's when I, and I, re, I remember the excitement and the buzz around you that, that you felt, uh, when you, when you carried it in to, to scan, um, and this, you know, I mean, that was a, a while ago, so my memory, I feel like, I feel like, uh, your friend Mark Romanowski may, may have come to the, come to the house with you from the studio that Probably. day. Probably. Um. And even like the the buzz was just rippling through all of you guys. They knew that you had made something, you know, something, yeah, something, something special in you know? a new direction. Yeah, yeah. and um, Gene came down and, and loved the painting. Um, but at that time, you know, this is from coming from conversations with Gene that I've had. Uh, she said, you know, she had no idea. She didn't really know about pinup at the time. Mm -hmm. She didn't right. know if she could make it successful or not. Right. It was a whole new area to uh, explore and find out about. Yeah. And so she dug in and but said it, it really kind of took her about a year. Uh, if I'm speaking incorrectly back there, Jean, please let Jean, me know. Can you hear? <laughs> huh? She's busy. She can't hear. We're talking about you and pinups. When I first brought the painting home, uh, and you we have to consult with the expert back then. And you were unaware of what to do, or you weren't sure of how to approach, you know, selling pinup art. 
She said she just said it's gonna, it'll take her five years to get this off the ground. And did it take you five years or one? It took five years. She said okay. it would take me five years to get your world known for this, and that's what it took her, and she did it. But she did it, and she did it extremely well, as opposed to the gallery that first gave me a show, which I don't want to really knock, I mean, because he's quite a reputation. But nonetheless, he gave me my first show in New York, so that I'm really grateful for, of my pinup art. But he did not really sell anything at all, not one painting, not yeah. one painting, and did not begin to promote promote around the world, and that was all Jean's doing. Uh, and she worked endlessly at it and succeeded. And it had a lot to buck, I mean, because, again, we talked about this before, people need, for some, not all people, not, but many people need to categorize, especially with artists, it, it, well, anybody, right? You're, are, you, are you this, are you that, are you conservative, are you liberal, are you, are you, you know, blah, 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 you know? And, and so people had known me as a fantasy artist. Yeah. Lord of the Rings. Oh my God. What's he doing here? So you had to fight that kind of mentality of people you know, thinking that I should I should be sticking with hobbits and not be doing this. And But nonetheless, she pulled it. She did it. She spent five years and she succeeded. So yeah, I'm going to focus on this aspect a, a little bit, you know, because that's one of the things we talked about was, you know, navigating changing genres to to have a, you know, mm -hmm. satisfying and su successful career. So, and up until this point, you know, you kind of transitioned seamlessly through these. You, you, you were invited in, you had people that were excited about you coming into comic books, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, or doing children's books, like, Taking portfolios into do Tolkien, uh, Star Wars found you from your name, from your Tolkien. So yeah. everything was kind of just flowing and grooving at that time. Uh, but this was a a, a very direct stop start mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yep. Uh, where you know you wanted to do it, you had to convince Gene uh, of of it being worthwhile. Now, what do I say about, you know, Gene obviously supports you yeah. you know, to, to, to no end, but she's also the kind of person that if she sees something that she truly doesn't think is going to work, she will tell you that it's, oh, it's, no it's not going to work. In no certain terms. Um, but she saw the product, she believed in the product, and she pushed and pushed and pushed. Now, in that five-year process, did you have any? Uh, Hi, I saw the product. Is that what you said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which product? Hey, 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 ups. Okay, so what actually what I actually said? Okay, well I don't know. I wasn't so, quoting. I know. Oh, should we turn the, <laughs> can we turn it towards you? No, no, no. Let me no, turn it towards you. Don't, well, you're in the corner there. You're I, just oh, see. Okay. You're looking around the corner. Okay. Because I'm putting away stock, so I'm hot sweating. Okay. But what I actually said, Keith, when you brought the animal leaving back to my office, was that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen you paint. Yeah. And that's what lit my fire to be able to go, okay, it's a whole new genre, let's go learn it. Yep. Yep. So, but that's that's been Jean, and ever since I've known her, when she first saw the Lord of the Rings art, she she fell in love with the art, and that's. And she is always, she was in sales. I mean, she was the first woman in the country to sell Porsche. The very first woman in this country to yep. be a, a Porsche saleswoman. And and the reason that she could sell them is because she loved the product. And that's that's her statement. If she loves something, she can sell it. If she doesn't, she can't sell it. Or won't sell it. Let's put yeah. it that way. Or, or both ways. So we're going to uh, address some uh, comments here. Uh, Jay Davies says, uh, Love seeing the behind-the-scenes perspective on art. Thanks for sharing. Thank you mm -hmm. for watching. Um, Pinups project such a warmth. They distill a snapshot of America in the 20th century to him. Uh, cool. Like other adult mediums, they don't come off as raw or explicit. They have atmosphere. Yep. That's uh, what I'm after. Uh, Philip Bork had said he had the opportunity to be at the opening of that first pinup show in oh, New really? York. And it was very cool to see. Awesome. Yeah, that was very exciting. That was a great day for me. I was really turned on. 
Yeah, and then Jay Davis, oh, it seems like Greg is most in love with the rendering technique to painting as opposed to the concept, which I think is what makes him such a prolific artist. Uh, he finds thrill in the technical challenge. Yeah, I do, and that's true. And concepts are important too. I mean, you know, but still it's ultimately, you know, I love the process of painting, of drawing and painting. And, but concepts, a concept that really grabs you could knock you over the head and really excite the hell out of you, you know? Yes. Um, I will, I'm going to make an outsider observation from of someone who knows you relatively well, you know. Uh, yes, yes, you do. Yeah. Um, the, for 99% of commercial jobs, that is absolutely 100% true because they're not your original concepts. Mm -hmm. They are the concept of other writers, of the other, publisher, of the creator, other of writers, of the, yeah. producers, directors, um, whatever. Artists. Because you, for the most part, you're engaged in like the cover art mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. uh, or a series of individual illustrations for card sets or things of that nature where you're not getting involved in the story making process mm -hmm. or, or anything like that. However, uh, with your personal works, going back to uh, the dream images, mm -hmm. this pinup series, uh, all of that you were very heavily invested in. What story am I telling? Absolutely. What is the, what is the concept? Um, and even your stuff that nobody has seen, the infinite amount of uh, projects that are on these shelves yep. stacked up of, yep. uh, of your own storytelling things, you've really you get into the minutia detail mm -hmm. of of everything mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> you know yeah. so uh <laughs> like yeah yeah jay davies uh, again for 99 percent of the commercial work that is a 100 percent accurate mm -hmm. observation mm -hmm. but uh, that yeah but yeah so um so going stepping back into the uh uh, the pinup realm. First, I want to ask you, okay, so I know Emerald Evening was the very first painting because that's the very first thing I saw mm -hmm. coming in. Was that the very first concept that you had or the idea? That no, you had, I probably do. Oh, God, I probably do 100, 200, 300, 500 things. Kept sketching and sketching and sketching and sketching and sketching. And I was looking at a lot of stuff. I went back and, and, and looked at a whole bunch of old pulp magazines. Uh, not only uh, paintings, but photography, you know, uh, film, uh, books, men's magazines uh, from the, the, the 30s, 40s, 50s, and just to try to get a feeling for all of that stuff. And then decided, you know, made the decision, well, I was going to be retro. That is to say, you know, I'm going to set these things back whenever. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't going to try to copy the style of exact style of that period to make it look like that if you saw my painting, you'd think that it actually was done in 1954. I didn't want that. Okay. I wanted it to look like back then from the present position of looking back at it, sort of. Like because, in other words, yeah. I'm applying my paint, painterliness or paintology or what the hell ever yeah. that I've accumulated, and now I'm doing that subject. Yeah, because sometimes you know it's like I'm not trying to be totally persnickety about every little accurate detail about it. I just want the general gist of something. You, you know what I'm saying? Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So it could be then, it could be now, sort of. Yeah, yeah. The, a, a blending or a blurring of the worlds. Right. It, 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 and it wasn't. I'm not. And I wasn't trying to be like exaggerate. I mean, you see a lot of retro pinup costumes now that, pe that women wear and they design. It's almost like a put-on of the, the 50s. Yeah. Not even an accurate take of the 50s. It's more like a you're putting it on, you're goofing on it. So yes, like yeah. Giant polka dotted dresses and crinoline, you know, makes, you know, all that. That was there, but it didn't exactly look like a lot of these things that people think that it may have looked like. It's, they're using their imaginations to go take, take off with it. And I was doing the same thing, only in my way. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that, that tends to happen, like, in, you know, on television or wherever, where they, like, if they're doing something from the 60s or from the 80s, 
they dress everybody into these extremes. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, that, that was on MTV in the 80s. Right. But right. you didn't see it down the street. Right. You know, um, right. in, in middle America. Yeah. You know, but so the one of the crucial steps then that you took that is, I think, is important for everybody to get is that you ultimately did your research before yeah. you ever produced a painting. You knew, okay, you were making that oh, switch, tons, tons. making the comp, yeah, the conscious effort to do the switch. So you dug in doing your research. Now, in your research, um, I know that you were familiar with Vargas and Elgrin and uh, any of Petty, the Moser. She was great. She was a, a one of the yeah. female of, uh, of painters of pinup art. She posts her own pictures. She she I've talked about her before. She did that fantastic painting of Jane Russell in the Outlaw. It's a, it's a look it up. She's laying back in the hay. You know, it, it's great. It's a beautiful painting. But she was a woman, and she painted, uh, you know, pinup art. So, I know, okay, you were exposed to them, you know, when you were younger. You, I'm sure you looked at them throughout your life. Mm -hmm. But at this time, doing your research, did you uh, get into them at all? Or did you make an effort to stay away from them? What was your approach to the giants of, of the genre? Well, yeah, no, I looked at them all. I mean, I was checking them all out, you know, going back and studying them. There was no conscious effort to try to emulate any one of their styles at all. In fact, I was against that. I didn't want to do that. It's the same with Tim and I did Terry and the Pirates. We, we, I did. I wouldn't do it if if, if, uh, if Tribune Media who owned it said, you know, imitate Milk and F. I would have nothing to do with it. You know, so they just said, no, do your own thing, make it look like whatever you want to make it look like. Just draw, and so. You know, no, I didn't. I had no effort to try to copy these these guys, women, not at all. I was inspired by them. It's the, the, the distinction, yeah. you know, there that you look at them to be inspired. And I wasn't really going to do paintings that of the of the storytelling that was in any one of the pictures either. Some of them were got kind of like in no uncertain terms, kind of goofy. Yeah. And were, were, you know, sort of like well, something I wouldn't want to emulate. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, but nonetheless, I looked at them for inspiration, you know, and I just came up with my own thing. So inspiration, but yet making a very, yeah, making, again, a very conscious effort to not do that, but to do, to do this. And, and to be, tell stories. I mean... Yeah, not, not maybe not all of them tell the company, but my uh, idea was I'm, I'm I'm not just doing pinup art, but I mean I'm coming from an illustration past. I'm coming yes. from a storytelling past, so a lot of the pinup art too, particularly Vargas, you know, was all a, a, a figure against white. Yeah, a vignette. A vignette, right. and I didn't want to do that at all. I wanted to show a whole scene. I wanted to tell a story, and you know, like I think the second one, that I, the third one that I laid out was a girl at a window looking through the Venetian blind, and and I just with a green light coming from the outside. For that, for me, was about, like, I wanted to combine a bunch of stuff. She has a gun in her hand. She's peering through the Venetian blind like she's troubled, like something. You don't know something's about to happen. Something happened. Something's going to happen. But the main, one of the main things about that picture that I first thought of that I wanted to try to pull off was Venetian blinds. Because <laughs> that's so 50s. That's so 40s. Yeah. Venetian blinds yeah. are, a, are iconic image. All the Betty Page photos and everything. So you want, I'm going to do something with Venetian blinds. What could that be? Well, let me see. So I'm going to look at pe peering through like something's going on outside, you know. So, but it started with Venetian blinds and more, and it moved into this whole more yeah. sudden see. danger yes. kind of like detective story cover sort of like look. The, the one thing that from my observation, again, just kind of given a general, you've done a lot of pinups, over 100. Um, but a lot of what happens in that genre, like you were, you were talking about, you know, there's the vignette, and even when it's moved into the sci-fi fantasy realm, uh, mm -hmm. you still get a figure that's kind of imposed on a background. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there might be, you know, stuff going on. They might even be riding a creature, mm -hmm. but it's clearly about that figure and everything else is secondary. And a lot of the stuff you were doing uh, with with that pinup is they were they were existing within a scene. Yeah, 
Exactly. You know? the, the elements of the scene were as important as the figure, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, it, like, it's, what's that? There was, you know, what's the story mm -hmm. going on here? It just happens to be a, a pinup, you know. It happens to be a pinup, and it, it's a kind of like a scene that you could read into it your own story. Yeah. You know, it, it isn't like uh, that specifically making a point, generally speaking. But you can you can approach it and I'll say, what's going on? Maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. And I get different kinds of stories from people, too, yeah. over the years about what's happening in that scene. I say, well, and they ask me what's happening. I say, well, whatever you want it to happen. That's the way that works. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter what I thought. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's the one, the, um, the Black Widow painting, where I misconstrued the nightgown all these years. I'm kind of a little disappointed, actually, that, that I found out the truth of the painting. Uh, but I, mean, I thought it was a, a nun's habit that was on a nun. <laughs> so well, that's all, good. all that's of these, whole, yeah, all of these no, years, good. like 20 years, I thought that that's what that was. And that we would see it something like, you know, that like something this comment, or or some whatever. common, some wild, no, yeah. not at all. It, was it wasn't like, that at it all. It happened to be a very nice uh, a robe that I happened to have <laughs> that I think James, yes, Jean's mother had that robe. That was a robe that Jean's mother had, which is from a period, you know. Yeah. And I just loved it. It was black velvet and everything. So <laughs> that's that's what that was. It had nothing to do with nuns. None of that. <laughs> so <laughs> that's bizarre. I never, I didn't know that. So <laughs> in in you got a stranger mind than I do. Well, anyway, I, whatever. I was interpreting your mind. <laughs> so. In, so in that, you know, that five years, you know, you, again, you, you know, you had that show. I think the show came within the first couple of years. It, no, the first year. I mean, we went over to okay. Lou Mizell's gallery, the yep. Great American Pinup downtown in uh, Soho, New York City. And uh, he flipped over the painting that he saw in the Emerald Evening. Gene sent it over to him. And, and he said, oh, he wanted to see more. And I already had about three started. I think it was the one I just said with the Venetian blinds. The other one was the... Uh, Hotel, yep. The, the the gals from the back, and there's a hand in the foreground with a yep. cigarette. Yep. Now that that whole scene to me, it was like I'm here. That, there's a hand in the foreground holding a cigarette in that picture, and well, it was my hand. All the hands you see in any of those pinup paintings are mine, but nonetheless, while I'm painting the picture, I'm hearing Humphrey Bogart's voice. That for me was that that scene was something from an old Bogart movie. That's what okay. that was all about, you know, sort of like thing. And I also looked up Edward Hopper. A magnificent, you know, he's one of my favorites. His his city stuff to see if he had done something. You know, I, I swore that he must have done, you know, the proverbial red hotel sign outside the window when you're inside the room, and you see the the red light. And no, he never did. There was no painting like that. I couldn't find one anywhere. It was it hit me as such an iconic sort of like picture, but nobody had painted it. So I felt kind of happy over that that I you know I could do that. So I did did it with this hotel sign. Only I left. Uh, all you can see is hot, you know, hot L. <laughs> you, you, yeah. you see, yeah. so, and, and that just happened accidentally because I had it outside the window, and the way the, the windows covered it and stuff like that. I didn't even plan that. One of those happy accidents. Yeah, and uh, so that was that one, and that was underway. And then the girl at the window, and I think then the Emerald Evening, and then I went into the city and showed them to the Mr. Mazel, and he gave me a show. And he said, well, how long will it be? He said, well, what? It's going to be two or three years. And she said, no, 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 no. You'll have them in a year. A year? I need about 25 paintings for a one-man show. And she said, you'll have them. And so I, I, I was like, well, well what? <laughs> so we, we left. And Jean said she cleared the decks, so to speak. She made my life everything. She cleared everything. It, it, no commissions, no jobs, nothing other than this one thing that I focused on for the entire year. And so I did... 25 paintings in that year and we got the show in that first year the end of that first year nice so that was where that worked so you you mentioned earlier that you had the show and nothing sold one uh, painting one painting pain. uh so but that was because of gene's effort <laughs> because it was a friend who bought it. yeah so but you that had to feel a little bit disappointing uh well yeah it did i mean you know it was kind of uh Weird too the way he acted. The, the gallery owner just left the building when when he went. Never was in, he never was in the gallery with the opening. 
that he just wasn't there. And I, I have no idea why. And I was like, where the hell is he? He was gone. So we did the whole show with just our Gene, me, and, and, you know, and whatever. And uh, friends. And, uh, I, you know, it was, you know, sort of. But there was a couple of good write-ups in some of the art, mm -hmm. the New York art, man, you know, newspapers. Yeah. They gave it a good review. So I thought, well, this is, that's, that's cool. That's cool. And people liked it. And so I kept at it, you know. Okay. So, yeah, I was, I was going to ask that. Like, was there any time uh, in that five years while you're really waiting for it to become uh, financially successful? You know, there's success of the images, of course. Mm -hmm. But there's the component of this is money. What you do for a job. We have to make a living here. Yeah. And oh yeah. So there, there was that reality. And then, yeah. Yeah. So was there any time where you maybe felt down or got discouraged, or were you just did you just have 100 percent faith and uh, I know this award. I just stayed at it, just like the. Uh, I was just listening. Well, Gene, you, Gene was the one. Gene, it's funny because you're on camera. So you're you're, so Gene, you're Gene, acting Gene. like you're hiding. So what, can, can you remember what was it? You remember the, the show at Mizell's where you you were the one that sold the painting, not Mizell. I did. And then you were the one that did all the promoting, not Mizell. I did. And uh, in that, how long it took for it to really start to sell? And did you ever feel any disappointment at all? Well, Greg, that yeah. first night I sold a fifteen thousand dollar painting. But there you go. So she sold so a fifteen thousand dollar painting the first night. Painting on the first night. And, and then and I said, okay, somebody wants to spend money on these. Let's go find them. That's all. That's and so you kept at it. And Gene kept me at it. It's, you know, we, I kept coming. I just kept coming up with concepts and ideas. You know, you draw, 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 draw. I draw like, God almighty, I have, I have mountains of sketches and pinup ideas. And I have tons of photographic sessions. I've got models. We get to a point, Gene and I will go through the sketches. And she will say, okay, this one. And then we stack up a bunch of them. And then we call models. And then we get the models over. And, and I shot. I've got a dozen photographed images that are still sitting over there on that shelf. Waiting Just to ready to paint. go. Okay. So one of them, the next will be, Jean will get it off the, 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 the list. We'll, we'll look at them all over again. She will say, okay, this one. Let's do this one. She'll write it on my board over here that she keeps a list of all the stuff I'm working on. Mm -hmm. That'll be next. And it's basically been that way for all this time since the first show. And But we've done other work, obviously. I mean, what the hell was all the other stuff I was doing? Yeah, what was all the other, who, what were all the other people we were doing jobs for all through the pinup, since the pinups? We were doing a lot of magic Ma stuff. Magic, stuff magic right? Yeah. Matt? A zillion things. Yeah. Harry Potter uh, yeah. cards, Magic the Gathering cards, uh, Marvel, a lot of covers from Marvel Comics, Even, uh, uh, private commissions. Revisiting the Tolkien stuff from those books. Yep. Um, yep. And, and and each thing, you, 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 you know, and it's, you, you get into it. I mean, like we're making the transitions. I, I can do that daily. I can go over my drawing board over there and sit there in the morning and draw certain subjects and come over here and paint something completely different. And I enjoy that. Yeah. I like the jumping around aspect of it. You know, it's like there's, it keeps your brain operating for one thing. Yeah. And I just like the, the, the differences of things, you know, that's, that's exciting to me. I just don't want to just do one thing. The, another key component that I just, you know, I want to point out is your attitude is everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, well, yeah. and it's like you, you got excited about an idea, showed that, uh, that idea to the person that you trust uh, more than anyone else on the mm -hmm. planet, and they believed in the idea. Mm -hmm. And so even though it took five years, you just plugged away because eventually you knew it would pay off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I had various people asking me, do you going to quit on this? Do you think that? You know that it's not working. I said, "No, hell no, man. I'm, I'm other artists. You know, yeah. I'm not to mention names. You know, and it's all about persistence. yeah, Gene said it's never easy. It's all about persistence. But remember the uh, the league of their own, the, the female baseball team. It's like one of them was whining about how, how hard yeah. it is, and and uh, the the coach Tom uh, Hanks. Tom Hanks says, "Hard is what makes it good." 
<laughs> you know, if, you know, if it gets comes easy, I, I that always I always found it to be true. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like to really work at something. To try, well, that means you're you're pushing yourself. That means you're pushing yourself. That's yeah. why it's hard because you're pushing yourself. You can lay back and just try to get away with something. You know? Yeah. Nah, you keep pushing yourself into the white space, into the unknown territory. You know? Yeah. So you know that's. I mean that's a. It's about it's about exploration to me too. Like I always feel like like you're you know as an artist I'm an explorer. I like to know. I explorers explore. Explorers really don't want to know what's around the next bend until they get there, because it's a discovery. Oh, look what I found. Yeah. You know, if you know it ahead of time, or you, yeah, you know, no, it's it's the effort to get there and uh, you find it and ah, look, look what I found. <laughs> Sorry, that made me think of a completely sidetracked. We'll talk about later with explorers and. Not knowing what's there. Okay. <laughs> Discover it. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. Um, any questions? Yeah, so, yeah, if anybody has any questions, comments, or whatever, uh, please feel free to chime in, ask away. Um, so, just as a recap for the people watching and are interested in learning how to navigate you know, your genres of. Uh, Having quality work, you know, when you when you go to make the move, have quality work, right? right. Uh, have people that believe in you and support you, and they will help make the connections to get there. Yep. And even though sometimes things are hard and take a long time, keep well, plugging. Keep on the way. path. You just you stay know? on the path. Don't get off the path. Yeah, and you. What's, what's great to me is that at that time it wasn't like, okay, well, it's taking so long, so maybe I need to change up something. Maybe I need to change up the look or I need to do this. You didn't do that. You just kept, 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 kept going. It. Kept at it. You, you knew you were on to it. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of time. Yep. Um, and, and like I say, again, I've got a, I've got a dozen of photographs that I can't wait to get to. I, and, you know, I'm pretty sure I know the first one I want to do. And uh, so it's sitting over there waiting for me. And and that's the fun of it. And in the meantime, I'm doing a bunch of other stuff. Yep. You know, at the same time, I'm excited about all the other things I'm doing. And let's talk about then, you know, your next transition. Um, someone just made a comment. Is there a genre you guys want to see more of in the art world? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. A genre in the art world. That's a good question. I don't know. I can't. I don't have a ready answer for that. It's not something that jumped on the top of my head. Is it you? No, Being never, an artist? I, yeah, I've never really... That's a good question. We can dwell on that. Maybe we can answer it next week. Yeah. I think I would like to see children's book uh, arts be taken a little bit more seriously. I mean, you have a few of the masters that mm -hmm. get the recognition, but not a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a, it's, that's a genre that, you know, I'm fond of, you've worked in quite yeah. a bit, um, mm -hmm. but like you said earlier, it kind of, oh, it has that stigma of being for children. Right. And in contemporary terms, I haven't done it for a long time, but when I was doing it back in the sixties, uh, late sixties, early seventies, there was that aspect of it to make it look like uh, flat art, you know, if you if you rendered something, you know, they, they put you down. And for me, I was uh, I was for me, children's book art was going back to the children's book that I had as a kid that I grew up on that my mother had. You know, I'm talking about artists like Arthur Rackham, Edmund Duloc, I mean, uh, Eleanor Abbott. My God, you should see her stuff. Magnificent, beautiful, holy shit, beautifully designed. These these were. People were, were producing art on the same level as so-called gallery painters, you know. Yeah. So that that to me was it, you know. It's, if it come back to that level, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, come back to that level. Let's, yeah, that's let, yeah. Let's someone else, uh, Carrie Sue, just says you have more quality. Yeah. yeah. Um. But in this, here's one of the paintings in that series that was done, and this was model here, Stacy. And who came to the lake here? This is a shot. I live on the lake, Gene. I live on the lake here. And this was at a friend's house, in, and he happened to have a, 
a gathering over there with people with their boats that came over, these old criss crafts and wooden boats. And, and, it, and, and it, we just sort of improvised the shoot. I didn't know that was going to happen. So we just got her out there and I started taking photographs. And that's what I ended up with here. You know? The, so to move out of the, the pinup uh, genre, mm -hmm. uh, your next big overarching thematic uh, body of work was then for the Trans Siberian Orchestra. Yep, a nice big shift. <laughs> a nice big <laughs> shift from pinup to, to Christmas. To Christmas. <laughs> right. to a, a, Not just Christmas, but. But it, rock and roll, you know, heavy metal, progressive rock yeah. Christmas. Whatever you want to call it, yeah. It's rock. Paul's term finally rock theater yep. is what he was really moving towards. You know, you know, a whole seven not rock opera. He got it. You know, yes, but he morphed it into rock theater. That's what he was after. Okay, and, and that, that makes I, sense. You can see that. Yeah, and you know when I I, and so that, that's another great big shift, and I love doing that. And that starts off too in a way that you don't expect. I mean, I wasn't looking for it, and yeah. then I go. The way a lot of this stuff, this pinup thing was just a conscious effort. I want to do pinup art, you know. That came, like from over that trap door opens and it fell out of my subconscious somewhere, and I said, "Oh, that's it. I want to do pinup art." But the TSO connection was completely, I don't know, really wild. Really. It was really interesting because Gene and I were upstairs wrapping Christmas presents. What that story? Yep. Yeah. We were wrapping Christmas presents, and we, as we wrap Christmas presents, we usually play Christmas music, right? And so we put them on the disc player, and I'm playing all the stuff, you know, what the hell ever, you know, Marlon Alonza, Frank Sinatra, you know, the, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, you know, all kinds of stuff, yeah. you know, you name it. And then behind the disc player, I found, I'm looking down there at the disc, and it's in shrink wrap, I, I pull this thing up, and it says, Trans-Siberian Orchestra. It's a Christmas cover. It's the uh, Christmas tree on it with a little kid. I said, "What the hell is this?" And what's, I didn't even know what it was. So I, I opened it up, and we said, "Did Gene, you want to play this?" She said, "Yeah, let's go back to Sinatra. I don't know. Let's play this." So I put it on, and it knocked both of us out. I mean, we're, it, it, you, it, you have this rock sound moving into traditional orchestration. You know, the Christmas music and other kinds of traditional sounding music and chorus and in and, and rock. And uh, it was fantastic. You could see there's some storyline. I didn't read it yet. And then we come to the album, we play it again. I think we rap, rap presents three three times over, just <laughs> playing the album three times. And then I had a studio that I was with other people, other artists, and I brought it in. I said, you guys are going to hear the best damn Christmas album ever. I put it on and a friend, one of my friends said, Oh, I've heard of them. A buddy of mine just saw them at the Beacon Theater in Manhattan. And, and I said, really? He, said, he got them, he got a hold of them, put them on the speakerphone, and this guy started saying, well, you got to see them live. It's lasers and pyro, and the, the light show is fantastic, and blah, blah, blah. I said, incredible. He said, oh, did you ever hear their rock album, Beethoven's Last Night? And I said, what's that? It was an album they recorded. And I said, oh, my God. Because I'm a Beethoven fan, I've been a Beethoven fan since I was a kid. I like classical yep. music and I yep. like rock and roll. And so I went out and got the album the next day, the disc, and and played it. And it knocked me on my ass. It just totally took me over. And I did something unique to the way Gene and I have always worked. I kind of like was playing it. I, she'd go up to bed and I'd stay down here working, and I play the album. And I started drawing sketches on it, completely with no idea that I'm doing a job. Yeah. I was just completely compelled, obsessed and compelled to do these sketches. Because I kept playing at the album down here in my drawing board. And then I started doing color renderings. I started doing color pencil and watercolor renderings. And I ended up, I, literally for two months or so, I, I did this. <laughs> and I ended up with a stack of art like that. And, and, I, and I came out of my stupor, kind of like literally is what it was. And I showed the stuff to Gene. She says, what the, what is this? I said, well, this is what it is. It was the music. She played it. And, and she looked at the art. And she said, oh my God. And I said, then suddenly I get practical minded. I say, do you think we should do something with it? And she said, well, who is it? I, I didn't even look to see who, who did the album. 
<laughs> I was just taking my, I looked, I said, Paul O'Neill, so she made a few phone calls and got a number in New York City at a recording studio. And she gave it to, and I said, well, you're going to call him? And, and she said, no, 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 this is a fanboy thing. You call. You know, and I said, you're right, it is a fanboy thing. So she gave me the number and I called the studio. And this guy comes on the phone and I asked for Paul O'Neill. He said, well, he's not here today. Uh, I said, this is Greg Hillebrand. And he, I took, he said, give me your number. I, I gave him my number the next day in my studio, because I was outside the house. I had a studio outside the house back then. And the phone rang and this voice comes on and said, is Greg Hildebrandt there? And I said, this is him. He said, this is Paul O'Neill. I can't believe you called me. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've been a fan of your work since the Lord of the Rings back in the 70s. <laughs> so we would, we'd start this whole, you're the man, or you're the man, or you're the man, kind of like thing on the phone. And I'm going nuts over his work, over his music. He's going nuts over my artwork. And, 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 and so he said, would you ever come into the city? I said, yeah, yeah, we come in. He said, well, well let's get together. And I, I tell Gene, and then they make the arrangement, you know, to meet at a, one of the rest, one of the three, only three restaurants that Paul ever ate out in the city. Mm -hmm. You talk about <laughs> getting his act now. You were in at three restaurants and say, this one happened to be a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and we went in and met him there. And there, there was Paul in his, in his black leather motor jacket, motorcycle jacket, and his black jeans, and his, his black you know, riding boots and his chain hanging out and his long hair and, you know, and, and he was like a hyper nice guy, fantastic. And, and he's taking all the art out in, in this Chinese restaurant and he's, we're sit, he's setting it up all on the walls. The waiters are all helping him set up the, all the artwork <laughs> all around the place. And, and he's going crazy over it and we're going on and on. And he said, well, uh, like, would you like to do something? I said, absolutely. So he said, uh, what? And I said, you know, maybe the cover for the program, you know, the, the, the Christmas program. And so that's how it started. That's fantastic. That's, that's, that's uh, but now what, is it 18 years? 19, yeah. 18 years? Yeah. And I mean, we're running to the end of the time and it would be um, remiss though if we didn't mention the Kid Stuff series that the, you had been involved in like photorealism Back in the seventies, yeah, and then moving back into that. So, stories for another day. That, well, there, yeah. <laughs> I think we can talk a little more about TSO, but just yeah. to hold this, I still have the very first painting from the very first program. It, it was like a, it's a two, you know, two paneled painting that wraps around the program. That's the very first painting that I did for Paul, and. We talked the concept out with him. He talked about he wanted a toy store window, and and we, we discussed it. And I started picking out the kind of toys, and he wanted this snow globe with their logo guitar in the snow globe, and he wanted this hand reaching towards it. This hand it was the handle of this angel in the story Christmas Eve and other stories, and so and the other elements in there I more or less start to assemble and put together. And we and then I did the painting, and, and Paul. While well, Paul bought every single painting that I did, he he wanted us to keep this one to make sure that we always had it, you know, in our home, and could uh, just just he wanted us to have it. You know, but that's the first painting I did. So, but yeah, yeah, the whole photorealism thing of my kid stuff. I collect toys and you know and puppets and things of that nature, and I've been painting their pictures, and that's a whole another story yeah know. uh there's so much to tell even like through with tso there's almost multiple genres within yeah well that's that's a big that's a big subject yeah in the, in the way that each image came into being you know the discussions between paul his manager adam gene and myself generally would be the four of us discussing it and somebody would start the idea off a lot of them were started by gene she would trigger off a concept. You know, as we got further and further along, we started to know each other as time went by. And the, But the whole effort for me was always, and Gene, and Adam, was always to get out of Paul what's in his head. He was the genius. He was the creator of this, this orchestra. It was his baby. It was his philosophy that 
emanated and, and affected everybody in the band in the whole operation. You know, his his way of thinking and his his thought process. And that's what I was always after, and I still am, even though Paul's been dead for several years. Our effort is still to what would Paul want? What would Paul want to see? You know? Yeah. That and that's always there. So yeah. All right. So we're gonna address a couple more uh, things and then we've gotta go because it's time. It's time to go do ad work. <laughs> time to do ad work. But uh, Keith, Keith is doing So Chris Fabs says, you know, he personally wants to see painted illustration album covers like back in the day. Well I'm all for it, man. Yeah. One thousand percent. The only uh, musical genre, to my knowledge, that still uses painted covers is heavy metal. Yeah. And maybe progressive progressive rock, progressive metal. Yeah. They still use it uh, uh, across the board. Yeah, there you go. And, the, uh, what are the, yeah, well, are the smart just, ones? Uh, and that's the stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a metalhead. Yep. Uh, um, so I've always been attracted to that album cover, which I think that's the first piece of your work. I ever became familiar with was Mob Rules. Mob Rules. Um, Bad but, Out of Hell. How about the uh, Meat Loaf's Bad Out of Hell album? That's great. Isn't that incredible? It's fantastic. Um, you know, I mean, obviously. And then who, who, was it? who was it? Molly Hatchet that used for Zara? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, so many um, great things. Like a lot of the uh, Danny Barry, Barry Jackson did a lot of the Ronnie James Dio stuff. Well, it's it's the same with movie posters too, right? I mean, it's yeah. all freaking everything's digital composites, and I'm not going to knock the idiom, but I'm just saying, where the hell is the paintings? I mean, where are yeah. the paintings for Christ's sake? Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, Photoshop came about, and then it just, ah, uh, you know, I don't. I what guess, is it? What, why, why is that? Because it, it, somebody once said, who the hell was it? Said that a painted movie poster makes the movie look old. I heard that. I heard somebody say. An idiot. <laughs> a painted poster will make the movie look old. Uh, okay. Like if it's not painted, it won't look old. What, what the fuck? Kind of, excuse my English. But, you know, it's like, you know, well, the thing you got to say is like, you know, Drew Struz and I'm assuming he's still doing. No, he's not painting any posters right now. No, he's more or less retired. Oh, okay. oh my God. How, how, he, you know, he, he was incredible. His stuff, you know, when it was up against all the other photographic stuff, it really stood oh out. Oh my God! So hard. Incredibly so. Bob Peak. Yeah. God, good grief, man. <laughs> Richard oh, himself. Get us a whole different I house. mean, I, it's like now look at the beauty of that it's art, yeah. I mean, you know. And then you just they stick all those photo composites together, and yep. I, it, it's yeah. it's just doesn't have it. Yep. Uh, and I'm not against photography. Don't take me wrong. Yeah. And Jay Davies said he liked more historical illustration, like Jean Leon. I'm going to butcher that last name, Jerome. Oh, uh, Jerome. Oh, God. Yes. Oh, well, yeah. All the the whole Academy stuff that was derided for a long, long, long time by Danes for French Academies. I mean, I mean, Waterhouse. Holy shit. The Pre Raphaelites. Oh, my God. Alma Tadema. Oh, my. They, they were freaking incredible. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, there's a whole group of people that emulate them now. You know, there are yes, painters yeah. that all emulate them. You know, they that was yeah. fantastic. But see, they, they all got once the impressionists, and I and I I always got to make the point that they, not the term of the so-called impressionists because they weren't trying to paint impressions; they were trying to get what they saw right in front of them in terms of color and light and composition. But that started, and that knocks out the academy. Yeah, it was a war between. And I, I get it. That's a whole interesting period, you know, of that battle between the, the academy paint. The academy became so goddamn restrictive yes. that they had a list of expressions that you could use in your paintings. This showed happiness. This showed this. This showed this. And you had to use all these poses. And so it became almost like the code in Hollywood. The can't and can't do some how to help you make a movie, you know. Yeah. All that. Anyway, that's a whole interesting period. So, as much as I love. The great Academy painters. There's a lot of people like in all genres that weren't all that great, but the great ones are they're fucking incredible. And and the impre so-called impressionists, I love their work too. And it's so good that we're back in time now that we don't have to join camps. We can look at both sides and see the beauty of it. But that that will, but the the so-called these people that Jerome that you mentioned and the others got knocked out of the picture. You could have bought a 
uh, a, a Waterhouse or a Jerome or, or, or any of those guys for a buck and a half. Nobody wanted them. They rolled them up and stuck them in their attics. It was like weird as hell. And Alan Funk was the one, though. He bought a bunch of Alma Tadema paintings. He was buying them up. He was candid camera for those people that don't look them up. He had a whole huge collection of this stuff. That, but that's a whole other, that's a, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. You know, art history is very interesting. You get into all these battles yes. and wars yeah. and the ups and the downs of it, and, you know. And I think it's best to zoom back and kind of like look at the best of the best and just take out of it what you like, and, you know, and be inspired by it all, you know. Yep, it doesn't have to be the binary. No, that's for the stupid. That's for the stupid to say that there's this or there's that and there's nothing else. Nope. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, so just to uh, remind you one more time, this is the end of the TSO uh, sale. We have, again, prints, lithographs, clothing is 50% off. Clothing is the only thing that's not marked on the website. Uh, but that will, the discount will be processed manually. Uh, old programs, things like that. Uh, that are beautiful collections in and of themselves. I mean, you know, Gene has done a phenomenal mm -hmm. job designing the program over the years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you missed one for one year, you like to see all that stuff and all the art. And really, and everything comes signed by Greg. Um, so, you know, today's the last day of it. Um, okay. And we thank you if you like what we're doing, if you like listening to Greg and all of his stories and the richness of his life. Please hit the like button, the subscribe button, leave your comments, uh, share it around with your friends and everyone else. Uh, thank you for all the feedback that has been coming through. Uh, we truly appreciate it. And so everybody have a great night. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Next week. All right. Good night, everyone. Finish. <laughs>